Sandra. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our session. We're going to talk a little bit today about Cisco Umbrella app visibility and blocking, which helps with shadow IT. I'm going to give a brief overview of the challenge out there in the marketplace and uh, this new functionality that we've introduced, and then I'm going to hand it over to Rohit, who's going to give you uh, a good look at the product in action uh, within the UI so that you can see how it works. We're going to start by talking a little bit about the shadow IT reality. I think most people realize this, that uh, in many organizations, the majority of their users are using a variety of uh, SaaS applications or cloud services that have not been cleared by IT or security. So in some recent studies, it was as much as 70 or 80%. Uh, the next factor that we see here, or good statistic, is that most organizations, especially large ones, have a very high number of SaaS applications that are in use. So in many of the companies that we've dealt with so far, we see that um, sometimes they anticipate having maybe 50 or 100 SaaS apps that are in use, when in reality it's uh, several hundred or even over a thousand. And the average in the large enterprises that we work with is over a thousand. Uh, and then the last item is, you know, what does this mean? What's the, the negative impact that this can have? Uh, many uh, analyst firms or IT experts are talking about how shadow IT is a strong area of risk, and we've seen a growing number of attacks that leverage some form of uh, shadow IT. And so you know, some organizations are predicting that it will be as many as a third of the attacks that happen will include some form of shadow IT activity. So what we're going to do is talk a little bit about uh, what we're going to do uh, about that to try and help control, guide, manage it. Um, if you see here, there's a quote from Gartner, and it talks about the fact that shadow IT is now accepted as something that you don't want to just stop completely. There's a lot of positive uh, side effects or positive things that can happen in an organization when your employees are empowered to go out and adopt services that help them do their job, that increase productivity. So you don't want to, or you can't really, uh, stop it completely, um, but you do want to guide it or manage it so that it, it's beneficial to the organization. And that's exactly what we're trying to do here with the uh, app discovery capability uh, and the subsequent blocking that you can do once you've evaluated those apps. Um, we're tackling three main challenges. The first one is visibility. I mentioned earlier that most companies are not aware of the full number of SaaS applications that are in use within their organization. Uh, once they do, it's typically big numbers, as we mentioned, and so if there's hundreds or even a thousand applications, the next challenge becomes, how do I get the information on who the vendor is, what category the application uh, is in, what type of risk does it present to my organization? Uh, and with the resource constraints that we have in security and IT, it's difficult to do that and to stay on top of it for hundreds and hundreds of applications. And then the last item is once you have the visibility and you've done a little bit of an evaluation and you understand that application and what's going on, you're probably going to want to optimize and then block some of the apps that are of high risk um, within your organization. And so those are the three areas that we're helping with. Uh, what we are releasing is within the Umbrella console itself. If you look on the right-hand side here, you can see the within the Umbrella UI, there's a reporting section. And under additional reports, you'll see app discovery at the bottom here. Um, that is where this set of information is available to you. Uh, it does, you know, this will be replacing the cloud services report if you're an existing Umbrella customer, you may be familiar with that, and that provided some basic insight into cloud apps, a smaller set of them. Um, but this will replace that over time. It provides additional coverage. So we're using what we call the Cloud App Security Index, uh, which has more than 10 times the number of applications um, that were detectable within the Cloud Services Report. We are providing more detailed information on the vendor, the application itself, the compliance certificates, and other risk factors. So we're going much deeper with regard to the background information. And then finally, we are providing some workflows, some the ability to organize these apps into different uh, categories or labels. 
and then uh, blocking a set of those core apps, either within, like either a category itself or individual apps. Now I just wanted to quickly, you know, Rohit's going to do the full demo, but I wanted to quickly explain how simple this is for an existing uh, Umbrella customer or even a new Umbrella customer. Uh, Umbrella DNS logs are being generated by Umbrella as it, um, you know, as it works in the, in the environment. The logs that are generated are automatically ingested into our app discovery engine. We run them against the Cloud App Security Index, and that allows us to create that initial dashboard, which you'll see, apps, uh, grid views, which is just lists of apps uh, filtered and broken down in various ways to make it convenient for you, and then individual app detail or risk profile pages uh, for each application that is discovered. All that happens automatically. Uh, and then when you're looking at a list of applications or an individual app, uh, there, there is a link there that will allow you to block that app. It brings you over to application settings in the Umbrella console with that application highlighted uh, so that you simply need to click Save uh, into the correct policy uh, that you want to apply it to uh, to make that blocking or to put that blocking in place. So quickly, the overall benefits that um, organizations report with regard to this is they do get the visibility into both existing and new cloud apps as they hit their environment. Uh, it allows them to reduce their risk. It helps them be more productive by organizing these apps. And so uh, with cloud storage, we have many companies that say, hey, I'm okay with having two or three different forms of cloud data storage or file storage. Uh, but I do not want 40 or 50 of them. And so it allows them to sort of manage things within a category. Um, it also helps them reduce cloud uh, or staff expenditures. Um, you know, many times there's redundancy if different parts of the organization are using, um, you know, multiple apps for the same type of, of capabilities. And then in general, this promotes healthy cloud adoption so that the organization can welcome the use of the cloud, their users are still empowered, but it does give them some ability to guide and manage that activity. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rohit, and he's going to take us through a bit of a demo. All right, great. Thank you so much, David, and hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Uh, nice to join you. My name is Rohit Sani, based out of Silicon Valley, uh, on the product team focusing on the CASB side of the business. And I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and um, we're going to get started with the demo. I think we'll probably take uh, a good uh, 30 minutes or so to go through that demo, and uh, I'll help orient you into what we have built um, and uh, start to take some actions on the product as well. So uh, if everyone can see my screen, um, you'll notice that I am actually in the Cisco Umbrella um, uh, UI. And uh, where we built that app discovery, as David was just mentioning, is under the reporting section. So previously, if you're used to going to the cloud services report, you will be redirected, as you can see here, based on uh, your package into the app discovery experience. I'm going to go ahead and go full screen here and then orient you to what's happening here. Now, mind you, this is a uh, curated environment, uh, a demo environment, so you see some actions that would be a little bit different than what you would notice on your end when you're accessing the product. Uh, but what I always like to do is just orient individuals into what you're seeing, because there's a lot of information here at first. Right at the top, under App Discovery, you'll see the number of applications that have been discovered. So you see 2,591 unreviewed applications. You see other applications that may have been labeled under audit, not approved or approved. We'll talk a lot more about that. We'll actually take those actions as part of this demo as well. Um, right underneath that, we have certain categories that we have actually highlighted. This was actually based on a very iterative cycle with customers. Uh, perhaps some of you were part of that cycle where we had it in limited availability. And a lot of our customers came back and said, well, give us some better guidance as to what we should look at. Because if you have 2,000 some apps, uh, and a typical organization is known to have thousands of apps, um, how do you make sense of it all? And this is something that we wanted to demystify. So this cards-based approach here around categories uh, that have perhaps high risk uh, or ones that are worth reviewing is something that we've iterated on. We'll deep dive into that as part of this demo as well. And this is actually dynamic for what it's worth. Uh, once you actually go through these categories, they'll actually disappear. Um, so that's, uh, I think, a very interesting feature as well. 
the other widget that you see here is DNS request by app risk. So what we're doing behind the scenes, as David mentioned, is we are actually ingesting DNS queries. We have access to them as part of the umbrella tenant that you're in. So we're continuously ingesting them. In this particular widget, we want to give you an overview as to what's happening in the last 30 days. And this is a dynamic widget. We'll go into more details where you can toggle risk, toggle the labels that you've also applied. And the actual graph will change, and it'll allow you to actually deep dive into a particular date if you want to go back in history and take a look at that. Uh, the other couple widgets that round out the dashboard, there's five in total. Uh, one is called Recent Unreviewed Apps. And this is, as the uh, term uh, is stated here, most recently discovered apps that have not been evaluated. What we heard from our customers once again was that once, we, once they have a handle on the applications that they care most about, what about the difference? Uh, what about the new ones coming in? Whether it be days ago or hours ago, we'd like to be able to um, segment those. And this is what's uh, taking place here. Once again, you have the ability to actually toggle these experiences, and we'll go through that in a little bit here. And then finally, we have what we call the apps by category and risk. Uh, this is once again a dynamic widget that allows you to toggle the experiences, slice and dice it, uh, actually even look at it uh, from different data sources if you have multiple sources uh, multiplexing into your environment. So we'll go through all this in a bit more detail, but I want to start at the top here. Once you've oriented yourself to the dashboard, probably the place that you'll begin is under unreviewed apps. You want to make sense of what's going on in your environment. And right at the top here, you'll see it's um, the application name, the actual category that it fits into underneath it, the vendor it comes from. Uh, you have columns corresponding to weighted risk, which you can kind of toggle over and see elements of that risk, which we'll talk more uh, in detail about. The number of identities uh, that are actually uh, associated with that application, the actual DNS requests, um, which ones uh, are maybe already blocked or percentage blocked based on umbrella intelligence, first and last detected, the actual app type, SAS, PASS, IAS, and the ability to actually label that application. And then you also see the call to action for some applications here to block the app. And this is an action we'll actually take as part of this demo as well. Um, the other thing I want to mention is that you do have at any point the ability to actually download a CSV file uh, if you so choose to. And you also have the ability to toggle some of these settings. So if there's too many columns there, uh, you can go ahead and do that as any UI would probably provide you. Uh, what, I, what I typically find most useful is to be able to make sense of this. You can toggle some of these experiences based on risk. If you wanted to, it will redraw the page, as you can see here. Um, but if you're looking for a specific um, application, let's go ahead and type in, since we're all on WebEx here, um, we'll go ahead and type in, let's say, something like WebEx. And it should show us those particular applications. If you have something in mind, same thing would apply to Netflix or YouTube or Facebook. If you have a sense of where your traffic is going or where people in your organization are already using applications. Uh, but of course, the element here of surprise and of discovery is, is one that um, is, is very paramount. So if we take a look at an example like this, and as you can see, you can do that you know, even beyond that. I could kind of segment that based on categories, based on risk, based on app type, uh, based on labels that I've applied, uh, if I've applied them, and date. Um, what you get is essentially the end result. And you can kind of deep dive this uh, a little bit further around what we call the app details page. So if I pick, for example, WebEx as a collaboration app, and I go into here, um, I will see that it's a relatively low risk score. Um, it has a short description about the application itself, the essential vanity domain. Um, and what happens here, and this might be a question on your mind, is, well, there's probably multiple domains or URLs associated with an application. How did you figure that out? That is the aforementioned Cloud App Security Index that we have. It's a rich index of 12,000 plus applications, as David was referring to. We have a set of research behind this. Uh, researchers, I should say as well. It's also very programmatic. It's based on APIs, um, which are built into this application. So we are surfacing the app URL. We're not surfacing all the URLs or domains associated with that application that may be tied to even the DNS requests. Um, so we're taking care of that for you. And this also goes into uh, efficacy when we talk about blocking, which we'll talk about later in this demo. So I um, want to orient you, to orient you to a few different elements of the app details page. We have something called risk details. And risk details specifically breaks down risk. Um, this is something you can actually continue to help us with. Um, risk can be very subjective at the end of the day. And if you believe that our risk scores are not what you would expect, please provide us that feedback. That actually goes back to the research team, and that's something we take um, um, very seriously. Uh, but beyond that, what we have is three elements. We have business risk. 
Uh, we have usage risk and vendor compliance. So let me break those down a little bit further for you. Uh, business risk is an assessment by a research team as to how the application is typically used. So this is actually researched manually, and WebEx is typically used in a corporate environment, so you can see uh, that's the selection point here. Um, the other element uh, or sub-element you see here is Web Reputation Score. This actually comes from our Talos Intelligence Engine. This is a branch of uh, the Cisco, um, uh, Cisco organization, as you may know, and uh, their core um, capabilities are around web reputation and intelligence uh, around threats. What we've done is we've actually taken in a programmatic feed through an API of the Web Reputation Score for all the applications we support. So up to 12,000 of them actually are shown here. They're a subset of this business risk score, as you can see here. We also have a call to action for you to be able to click on this and actually bring up the Talos Intelligence website where I'll talk about WebEx, for example, or any application you've selected to be able to allow you to deep dive into this or IP, rep IP reputation, et cetera. So you can provide a lot more detail, but as you can see here, the web reputation, which is a good one, as you can imagine, for WebEx, comes in here and is surfaced as part of our UI. Another element that we get programmatically is something called the financial viability risk. This comes from another authority in the marketplace referred to as Dun & Bradstreet. And in a nutshell, what Dun & Bradstreet does is they assess or quantify the financial solvency of particular companies. Um, so, you know, a Cisco or a Google or Apple, you would expect it to be, you know, good, average, et cetera. Uh, but there are a lot of applications that are maybe startups, rogue applications from different countries that you may not have ever heard of. So the app detail page uh, provides you not only the description and the domain associated with it, but elements like financial viability, web reputation help you understand if there's an element of risk involved here as well. If there's low financial viability, then maybe there's a risk of that company going under or its financial solvency uh, being suspect. And that may be something you care about when you're making decisions around applications that your users are using, which is why it's a subset of the business risk score. And then finally, uh, we have what we call the data storage element. What form of data does the service store? So in a typical example, uh, you might have a um, you know, popular one might be Salesforce or ServiceNow, highly structured um, data environments uh, with objects and fields. Um, that is, um, uh, that's something that we assess. And why we do that is because um, in some cases, structured environments have less uh, risk associated with them than maybe unstructured environments, as you can see here. And that's something that our research team has actually assessed uh, over time and learned from, and that's why we surfaced that here. Once again, a lot of this can be highly subjective, and depending on the environment you're in and how you're using an application, take, for example, Facebook, YouTube, could be used for personal use, could be used for corporate use, um, and, um, and you run the gamut of all of those. Um, it does vary. So that is an element that we present to you to allow you to make better decisions. Uh, rolling out the other uh, elements we have here, one is called usage risk. And usage risk is really just a function of how many DNS requests that we're seeing uh, going to that application. The idea behind this is if you have more traffic or DNS requests coming in, uh, there's a likelihood of more information being out there in the cloud that may represent more risk. So um, it may be alarming at first to see something like very high or higher risk associated with an application that you know about. However, the uh, hypothesis around that is that there's more of a chance of leakage, exposures, PII, um, as a result of that application. So that's our element of usage risk. And finally, what we also research is vendor compliance. So associated with the vendor here, in this case Cisco, um, are there certifications that we are aware of, FedRAMP, ISO, PCI, et cetera. So that's something that we also surface here in the application, and we provide that for all the applications that you can see here under the element of risk details. Uh, this will, of course, evolve over time. Uh, we look at things like uh, single sign-on, multi-factor authentication, SSL certs, et cetera. So our roadmap is quite extensive in terms of further populating the risk elements, as other vendors do as well, to be able to surface this information. Um, I'm going to move on from there to other elements here. We have identity. So the identity that you actually see as part of your application, um, people that are going there, guest Wi-Fi, certain headquarter branch locations, maybe individuals, roaming clients, you would actually see that here as part of identities. You'd see the DNS requests associated with it, first, last detected, the ability to kind of slice and dice that, take that to a CSV file. This is where you get into more of the forensics uh, when you are researching applications. 
So that in a nutshell is what is provided at this level. Um, for now, I'm going to go ahead and take this action. We do approve WebEx, as you can imagine here within Cisco. I'm going to go ahead and approve that. And this is the first action I've taken in my environment. So what I wanted to show you is that now if I go into the app that I approve right here at the top, you will see that uh, WebEx will appear here along with other things that I have curated in the past um, that I approve. And so this is something we'll come back to, and we'll talk about not approved and under audit in a second as well. But these are essentially labels that allow you to um, manage your environment. And our hope, and also our feedback from customers has been that we want this uh, so we can have better conversations with our stakeholders and organizations around procurement, around finance, around um, you know, perhaps even presenting to my CISO in my weekly meeting around what's happening in my environment. And this is something we continue to iterate on but it's a, it's a feedback element that we've received that workflow management is important. So with that, I'm going to kind of go deep dive into a few of the other um, areas that I highlighted right at the top here so you can see what that looks like, and we'll start taking actions on those as well. So let's deep dive into um, these cards. As I mentioned, uh, we got feedback from customers that this was important to them to just kind of make sense of what's going on. So what this provides is it's labeled, or sorry, it's categorized anonymizers. Uh, anonymizers, just like P2P or maybe gaming applications, can be relatively risky. As you can see here, there's an element of risk associated here. So let's go ahead and take a look at Private Tunnel. I'm not familiar with that particular application. It provides VPN solutions to provide uh, to protect internet traffic. If I wanted, I can go ahead and click on that provisioning domain. It'll bring it up. It'll show me what PrivateTunnel.com is all about. Um, if I want to uh, go ahead and research that a little bit more. But I can see here that there's elements of risk associated with this application. And that may be something that I'm just not comfortable with in my environment. So um, what I'm going to go ahead and do here, I can see not a ton of identities going there, but certain identities that may be suspect or something that I actually want to just kind of keep tabs on. I'm going to go ahead and click on that and say not approved. And it's going to go ahead and put that in the not approved bucket. We'll come back to that later and actually taking a block, we'll take a blocking action on that a little bit later. So. Um, we'll come, to, come back to that. The other element that I want to show you here as far as widgets is DNS requests by at risk. Uh, so as I mentioned, this is one where you can toggle these experiences. For example, if I wanted to see medium and high risk applications over the last 30 days, uh, you'll see that the actual graph redraws itself. It'll show me that if I want to look at something that was not approved or perhaps under audit, so I could kind of slice and dice that a little bit further, perhaps take a snapshot of that, put that into my weekly report, uh, or surface that to my stakeholders, I can go ahead and do that. Um, and I can go back in time and say, okay, well, on August 29th, what was actually taking place in my environment? So this will actually go ahead and surface that usage data. You can see the elements here that are filtered around medium and high risk. And I can see that on this particular date, there was actual usage with respect to these applications in my environment. Some of them, like maybe Instagram, are already approved. Other ones that maybe I don't know about I could go ahead and take action on. So once again, this is something that I could go ahead and say, okay, well, addicted games, uh, I got seen a, a six requests going in there. I'm going to go ahead and place that under audit. That might be something I just want to keep tabs on. If I go in under audit, now I'm going to go ahead and see addicted games and other um, applications that maybe I'm just kind of monitoring for now uh, to, to determine whether this is something that poses risk to my environment. Um, other elements on this page, uh, the one I mentioned earlier was recently unreviewed applications. This allows you to go ahead and just look at the difference and uh, any new applications. Once again, you can go ahead and toggle these experiences based on risk. Uh, you can reset that as well. It'll allow you to go in here and say, okay, well, there's a bunch of applications that are being used. And once again, do I assess them? Do I evaluate them? Maybe uh, MetaMarkets as a BI app is something that I just want to keep tabs on because we have a concerted effort to be able to wrap our arms around the BI applications that, were, that are being used in our environment. And this goes back to a point that David made earlier as well, which is that it's not always about security and risk um, as a result of shadow IT. You may actually want to just get a hold of or get a grasp of expenditure and healthy cloud adoption. Uh, if you have a sanctioned application in your BI environment, uh, maybe it's Tableau, maybe it's another element uh, or another application, that may be something you want to steer your users towards. Likewise, you see that with communication or collaboration applications. Cloud storage is a classic example when you look at something like Dropbox or Box. Typically, environments are using one, not the other, although they may 
uh, uh, condone or uh, be cognizant of the fact that there's vendors that may be using others. So you might want to place those applications under audit and just kind of keep tabs on them and monitor what sort of usage is taking place. That's what this particular widget allows you to do, evaluate it and be able to slice and dice that information, reset that, kind of go in there and take a look at just what's different, what's new in my environment um, since the last time I maybe came into this environment. One thing worth noting, if it wasn't made very clear, is that this does this dashboard does evolve and change uh, on a nightly basis. So we're aggregating the DNS requests. Uh, we have a job that's running uh, every night to be able to actually um, surface that information. So you're going to always see fresh data. The risk scores that I mentioned earlier around Dun & Bradstreet, around Talos, are also updated uh, through API feeds on a nightly basis. So you're going to see fresh information as it evolves. Apps by category and risk is the last widget that I want to show you before we get into other actions. Um, and this one is also a neat little widget here where you can slice and dice some of this information based on um, the risk ratings and also based on maybe any labels that you've provided. So you can go ahead and take a look at, you know, we said business intelligence earlier, um, office productivity, education, that's always a neat one. What sort of applications are being used that maybe are medium or high risk in my environment associated with education. Uh, you can see that DNS requests in my environment are going to universities or e-learning sites. Some you may be aware of, others maybe you have no idea around. And this is once again an opportunity to say, well, what are my users using and why are they using it? Are they missing something that maybe we can provide them as a corporation? Um, and is that something that uh, our e-learning department or our training support department should be cognizant of? And that's something that you can then uh, go ahead and take forward uh, as you wish. So with that, I'm going to go back uh, in the interest of time here to surface some actions around this, and this gets into some of the media stuff around what actions you can take, blocking and policy setting within the Umbrella UI, something we have introduced as part of the app discovery and blocking flows. So I'm going to go ahead and go into the 18 non-approved apps I have, and the hypothesis here would be, okay, well, if they're not approved, maybe I want to go ahead and take action on them. And you can see here that there are calls to action with associate, associated sorry, with blocking this application. And uh, there was one particular one, I think it was the um, anonymizer. So let's go ahead and actually look for anonymizer here as a function of what we're doing. And I believe it was, yes, private tunnel that we actually looked at. Very high risk, something that has um, uh, identity and DNS requests going into it. In fact, the highest on this list. And so I want to go ahead and take action on it. If I go ahead and click on block this app, um, it will actually bring up another tab that will drop me simply into the app settings within Umbrella. So if we wait for that to come up here, um, what you'll see happen is that private tunnel will be selected by default um, as the application that we want to block. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see that we've dropped ourselves into the app settings section uh, of our page. And as the uh, UI draws itself here, I apologize, um, you can see that if I go into, well, first off, at the bottom, you can see choose a setting, save it, remember to apply to a policy. So it's a, a quick reminder as to how to go ahead and set policies in Umbrella. But if I click on default settings, you can see that automatically private tunnel was actually selected or pre-selected based on that action that I took. I can go ahead and um, um, you know, keep that as is, click on save, um, and uh, then basically the default setting will be applied. Now what you can do is you can go into your DNS and web policies and now you can establish that app setting as a function of those policies. So if we go into, say, app policy, which I have built out already as a policy within Umbrella, um, I can apply my default settings or I can get more granular. So I could, sit, uh, I could go ahead and select default settings. And if I go into anonymizers, um, in this case, it's actually uh, selected all of them. But um, I could go ahead and search for private tunnel as the application I want to block. Or, um, as you can see here, you can actually have a block allow scenario. And what that implies is you may want to go ahead and block all anonymizer applications, which you can do here, but simply allow certain ones. So maybe mega proxies anonymizer that you're comfortable with. Um, you can go ahead and say, I want to allow that one, go ahead and apply that. Um, let's not block that particular one, but let's go ahead and block all the other ones that fit into this category. So you have an element of categorization here that you can see. Um, likewise, you can go ahead and go through uh, more specific scenarios where you look at box and draw box, and you might want to go ahead and block those applications or perhaps allow one, not the other. 
and uh, this is something that you can go ahead and just enable. Um, it'll give you a confirmation as to what you are doing. So in this case, private tunnel, other anonymizer applications, other ones that were maybe selected as part of this policy in the past. Uh, you can go ahead and select, and then it will confirm that, allow me to go ahead and build out that policy. And once I go and do that, then the policy will go into effect. So anyone that is actually navigating to that particular site will then see uh, that that is blocked by Umbrella. Uh, as you may know, as part of the Umbrella workflow, you can go ahead and create custom block pages if you wanted to, um, to be able to actually um, you know, provide messaging to your users around the fact that maybe these applications are not allowed for certain reasons. This is the default message that comes up, but you could actually go ahead and uh, put some more details around that, customize it to encourage usage, like, hey, we are not sanctioning uh, Dropbox as an application, we sanction Box. Please go ahead and use Box, and you can have a call to action there. Uh, this is a function of the Umbrella product today, as you may well know. So that's how we've integrated blocking, and that's something that is going to evolve over time. Um, right now, you notice that uh, it comes up in another tab. It's going to be a more native uh, UI, a user experience, I, I'll say, uh, over time. And uh, we'll also get into some scenarios where we support all categories from within this, um, within this UI, such that if you want to go ahead and block all anonymizers, there'll be a call to actually do that as opposed to just at the individual application level. Um, so with that, uh, there's a couple other things I want to cover as part of my demo, um, just in terms of stakeholder management and sharing this information. Um, as part of our roadmap, we are certainly looking at uh, more robust reporting, but for the time being, we do have the ability for you to download this to a PDF file. That's something you can do easily, share that with your stakeholders as you wish. Um, and I mentioned earlier, in, uh, in meetings that take place uh, periodically or perhaps send that across, um, and then you also have the ability to deep dive into any of these areas and take that as a CSV file, which is something our customers are doing today uh, because they want a highly targeted report around perhaps the not approved or uh, P2P applications that they care most about in their environment. So that is the ability to take this forward uh, as part of our roadmap. We're going to continue to iterate on that and provide more details uh, around this experience. And as you can imagine, we are looking at um, surfacing more categories, uh, more risk elements, and allowing you to take more action in terms of the applications that we surface for blocking as well. Uh, that concludes the demo portion of this uh, presentation. I believe I'm going to turn it back to David, who has some other uh, wrap-up details to share with you. Thank you, Rohit. <clears throat> so I just wanted to cover, we've gotten several questions in the Q&A window about uh, availability. And so with regard to the rollout schedule, uh, Cisco Umbrella is broken into three main package types, and the first one is platform. And for all platform customers, uh, this availability or uh, this uh, functionality is available now. And so, you know, as this uh, gets turned on, there's a message in your initial dashboard when you go into Umbrella that lets you know uh, that this functionality is live, and there's a link there that'll take you right to the report. Uh, Insight customers are being turned on over the next couple of weeks, and so there were a couple of people um, on the webcast who said it was not in their console yet. Uh, we are just rolling that out over time over the next few weeks to all Insight customers, so that will be there soon. And again, you will have an in-product message in your dashboard uh, as soon as it is uh, available to you. And then for professional package customers, this will be a uh, add-on purchase. And so that will be orderable in October. And so those are the kind of three main types. There are some people live right now. Uh, if you are an Insights customer and you need access to this, um, you know, you can contact your uh, sales team or whatever, and we can look to make sure that uh, you get it as soon as possible. Like I say, uh, it all will uh, be available to Insight customers within the next few weeks. So there will not be too much uh, of a delay. Uh, so with that, we just want to welcome you to continue to put questions in. Uh, the Q&A section will be open for a couple of moments uh, or a couple of minutes here as we uh, finish up the presentation. Uh, if you are interested in this capability, the next steps would be to reach out to your Cisco uh, partner representative or your account manager. Uh, you can also learn more at the two links that are here. There's a uh, 
blog announcement uh, talking more about the functionality. There is a data sheet as well that uh, gives you a little bit more detail and some screenshots of the functionality. Um, and so with that, we will continue to answer the questions. I wanted to highlight uh, just a few of the uh, couple of questions that come in about the difference between labeling an app and an app. And so I just want to clarify on that, that the uh, labels, what we refer to as labels with regard to approved or not approved, those are an organizational tool, and so they allow you to look at your applications and start to put them into those labels or to label them so that they go into a group so that then you can look through your reports and different views of your applications and use that as a filter. Uh, it helps you keep an eye on sort of what's been approved, and then if you were to do a filter on category, you could look across different categories of applications uh, of what you had approved. So those are really just labels, and the reason for that is that when you actually go to block uh, applications, typically there's some nuance there. Do you want to block it for certain networks? Do you want to block it for uh, a certain department or most departments, uh, specific individuals? So the blocking is really that fun later functionality that Rohit gave an overview of, where you actually go in and block the app, and then you apply it to the appropriate policy. Uh, for where you want that to take effect. So there is a difference between labels and then actual blocking. Uh, let's see, several of the other questions were, were about uh, availability, so we did just cover that. Um, there was also a question about allowing applications, and so just with regard to what's next with regard to this area of functionality, uh, right now blocking is enabled. What we are going to do is we've seen the use case in some of our limited availability customers where they would like to block an entire category but then allow one single app or maybe a couple of apps. And so that, that capability of allowing um, can be simpler if you're getting a large volume of apps. And so that is something that we're working on and will be available uh, within the solution uh, in the future. Um, one of the other items that's on the roadmap is going into deeper levels of activity control within an application. So right here we're highlighting visibility, risk information, and blocking. Well, one of the next steps is there's some apps that are in a middle ground where you are not going to block them entirely, but you want to limit what some of the activities are for those applications. And that's something we're working on as well and will be available in the future. So those were the uh, main questions, and that uh, sort of concludes our content. Uh, like I say, if you have additional questions, please just type them into the Q&A section, and thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, David and Rohit. I appreciate your presentation today. Also, um, we have our next Demo Friday that's coming up next Friday. It'll be September 21st where we'll demo the latest developments with Cisco's Firepower Next Generation Firewall. Please join us then, and you can see the link in the chat window for more details on that demo Friday. We will be here to answer some questions, um, so if you do have some additional questions, go ahead and chat, put those in the Q&A panel. Otherwise, when you go, can I get your help? Please tell us how today's session went by filling out the survey that'll pop up on your exit, and especially tell us any topics you'd like to see in the future we value your input. Have a good rest of your day, and bye for now.